Hi, and welcome to another PACER project video. This is, my name is Johnny Owens. I'm the Director of Research and Clinical Education for Owens Recovery Science. Um, I've done this talk today in collaboration with my partner, Dr. Lawrence Cahalan, uh, who's a professor and PT at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. What we're gonna talk about today is blood flow restriction training and how it might be beneficial for the uh, COVID and the ICU patient. Do have some disclaimers, this course is intended for educational purposes and does not replace mentorship or consultation with more experienced cardiopulmonary or acute care colleagues. And this content is current at the time of dissemination, however, realize that the evidence and science on COVID-19 is evolving rapidly. So as you know and might imagine, this information is subject to change. Have some disclosures for myself here. Today we're going to discuss what blood flow restriction is. We're gonna discuss how it may be applied for post-intensive care syndrome. We're gonna describe the pathophysiology of COVID-19 and the potential use for BFR. We're gonna review the application of BFR from the ICU to the outpatient setting and understand the rapid loss of muscle that's due to disuse. So we're gonna break this down into two parts. How blood flow restriction may be able to assist the post-intensive care syndrome, so people who have been through disuse and have lost uh, quite a bit of capacity, as well as maybe, um, the benefit of blood flow restriction in relation to the pathophysiology of what COVID-19 is doing to the body. So first we need to get into the post-intensive care syndrome. Post-intensive care syndrome is a, is a term that was coined over a decade ago to help raise awareness that these individuals um, are still suffering from quite a bit of disability. There's greater than 4 million of ICU survivors a year um, in the United States and physical complications are gonna occur in around 70% of people once they're discharged from the ICU. These physical complications will um, equal a loss of muscle strength, reduce pulmonary function, pain, reduce walking ability, and activities of daily living. One thing that we do know, and this is true just with physiology, uh, but also true in the PICS literature, is the longer your ICU duration, the more muscle loss you're gonna have. So the longer an individual's in the intensive care, the more you're gonna see um, rapid muscle wasting. I think we've all seen pictures of individuals after the intensive care. This is a healthy young gentleman um, who came down with COVID-19 and after six weeks had just had a massive dump of muscle. And so you imagine what it's gonna do to the quality of life and the physical capacity of a healthy young individual. You really have to imagine what this will do with this much muscle loss for an elderly, um, often with comorbidity type of patients. And this is beyond just physical impairment. So people who suffer post-intensive care syndrome at one year follow-up typically have 34% anxiety, 33% depression, and almost 20% of post-traumatic stress disorder. Also, there's the dreaded readmission that happens with this syndrome. So 80% of ARD survivors require at least one readmission to a skilled nursing facility, hospital, or rehabilitation, and it's pretty quickly. So they get out and they, they typically will have a relapse, either physical or of their condition, um, and, and a third of these readmissions will occur within one month of discharge. And kind of put into perspective here and how this can really take you down, the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD literature shows that a non-elective exacerbation related to hospitalization will result generally in a significant reduction in quad muscle function, exercise capacity, physical activity, mood status, quality of life, and this will not spontaneously recover after discharge. So once these folks go back in, obviously they're going to get significantly worse. It's not going to spontaneously get better. So they do need some support. So why would we want to start discussing blood flow restriction for the post-intensive care syndrome patient? Well, for one reason, what we're doing right now might not be enough. And so this is a systematic review and meta-analysis that looked that does rehabilitation for the post-intensive care person um, imp improve their quality of life. And basically the conclusion was enhanced physical rehabilitation following ICU discharge may make little or no difference to quality of life or mortality among patients who receive mechanical ventilation in the ICU. So already starting to see data out there that's showing that maybe what we're doing isn't enough. And maybe some of the reasons why what we're doing isn't enough is because we're kind of limited in what we can do. We know from physiology that muscle requires load. And if you've lost tons of muscle because of your time in the intensive care unit, you're going to require quite a bit of, of 
of loading to try and get that muscle back. The ACSM guidelines recommend novice or intermediate lifters lift 75 to 85% of a one rep max to get strength and hypertrophy. And this has to be done for weeks. Almost none of our patients, typically, especially the elderly patient, especially the ones that are getting out of the intensive care unit, are going to be able to go through a program like this. And instead, we work on these kind of light load kind of parameters. There's no alternative ACSM lift lightweight guideline out there that says, well, if you can't lift heavy, just go ahead and lift lightweight. You're going to put muscle and strength on. So they're doing things. It's sort of glorified active range of motion but they're not even coming close to these ACSM guidelines. And that might be why um, we're still suffering these physical impairments because we're never able to restore their lost muscle. So let's get into what blood flow restriction is and how it might help. First, what's blood flow restriction? Blood flow restriction is the application of a tourniquet to the proximal thigh or the proximal upper arm. Once we get that tourniquet on an individual, we need to inflate it to reduce blood flow into the limb. We typically follow these standards that we use 80%, typically between 60 to 80% limb occlusion pressure in the lower extremity, and we lose 50% of limb occlusion pressure in the upper extremity. What that means is when we put the tourniquet on, we inflate it all the way to 100% where we get no more arterial inflow into the limb. Once we see that number, so say it's 250 millimeters of mercury, that is what we call 100% of limb occlusion pressure. But we don't do blood flow restriction at 100%. We don't completely block blood flow going into the limb. So we'll back it off a bit. Kind of best evidence right now is the 60 to 80% occlusion pressure in the lower extremities has the best effect and in the upper extremities it's a little bit less actually between 40 to 50 percent limb occlusion pressure seems to have the best effect so once we are able to reduce blood flow into the limb then we can start doing exercises um, with a reduced amount of blood in in that limb which can kind of tilt the curve from the aerobic oxidative side of muscle strengthening to the anaerobic fast twitch side of muscle strengthening just simply because there's not enough oxygen on board. So this patient here, she has a tourniquet on her lower extremity. It's at 80% limb occlusion pressure. She's doing sideline hip abduction. The way we dose this out typically is we use a very low load, either no load at all or up to about 30% of a one rep maximum if you can find that what that one rep max is for that individual. They go through four sets and reps. So the first set is a set, a high volume set of 30 reps. So they do 30 reps up and down of whatever exercise it is that you're doing. And that first set of 30 is really pretty easy because they still have muscle in, I mean, they still have oxygen within the muscle, but that, that oxygen has been depleted. So it's only going to be there for a short amount of time. So that first set of 30 is basically to ring out the Krebs cycle. So it feels easy. You're still using Krebs, which is using slow twitch, which is what your body wants to use, which is what we typically use in rehab. Then you do a 30 second rest period and you keep the tourniquet on during this entire 30 second rest period. So you're not allowing more oxygen in. And then they go into the next set of exercises and that's a set of 15. Now it starts to get harder because all of a sudden, even though they're lifting just their leg or a light weight, Krebs cycles tapped out because there's no more oxygen on board and they have to switch over to fast twitch metabolism. Your body really only likes to use this, these fast twitch muscle fibers, these anaerobic muscle fibers for, for purposeful things like lifting something very heavy, doing a sprint, um, something that is evolutionary wise that you need to use these big power muscles to get them out. It always prefers to use the slow twitch fiber, but there is enough oxygen on board, even though you're lifting light, Krebs cycle cannot work properly, so you switch to fast twitch metabolism. At this point, you really start to, to see the byproducts of that fast twitch metabolism. That fast twitch byproduct is lactate. So for every one glucose molecule, that you use in fast twitch metabolism, you're gonna cleave off a few lactate molecules and, and some hydrogen ions, the muscle gets acidic. And that's the burn that you typically feel whenever you're lifting heavy weights or doing some, some high intensity type of exercise. So those muscle metabolites start to build up in there and start to create a signal, which we'll talk about in a second. After that first set of 15, you take another 30 second rest. We keep the tourniquet on, we're blocking all those muscle metabolites, we're not allowing more oxygen to come in. And from that, then you move into a second set of 15. Now this one's really hard because you're starting to use more and more fast twitch fibers. You're building up more of those mus muscle metabolites and the leg starts to feel really fatigued. You do another 30 second rest and then you do a final 
set of 15. That final set of 15, you really hope you're maxing out all the last bit of fast twitch fibers that muscle has. If you take the muscle to fatigue or failure, that's the anabolic win, that's the physiological jackpot. So it's four sets, 30, 15, 15, 15, with 30 second rest periods. If you go up and down nice and slow, one, two up, one, two down during that exercise, that typically takes about six to seven minutes worth of time. Once you're done with that exercise, you simply deflate the tourniquet. You get this reperfusion of blood. It's one of the best feelings ever because your leg's really full of all that lactate and it feels like it's just been through a massive workout. Um, and then you can reinflate and move on to another muscle group to go ahead and fatigue that out. What we see from this is when you reduce that arterial flow, you're gonna to start to see more and more muscle activation. So if you put an EMG on, if you measure muscle activation, this has been looked at in, in lots of BFR studies, that you'll see that there's a higher EMG signal as you go on with BFR, and it's always significantly higher than the low level exercise because low level exercise is just using slow twitch fibers. They're not the big motor units. So you don't see that you're getting more and more and more of this muscle activation. You also, as you're using those fast twitch fibers, as I said, you're gonna build up a lot of muscle metabolites, a lot of burning. The tourniquet blocks venous return. So we're reducing arterial inflow. The arteries are thicker than the veins. Whenever we reduce arterial inflow at these pressures we're using, we, we block venous return 100% that starts to block all those metabolites in there. And when you block all those metabolites, you start to get this downstream anabolic signal. So one of the first things that recognizes this increase in lactate is the pituitary gland. So it is directly sensing this acidity that's going on within the muscle. And whenever it senses that the muscle is getting this acidity, it starts to release some of these anabolic products. One of them is growth hormone. So HGH you'll see in all the BFR studies, lactate levels will start to go up and growth hormone levels will start to follow that almost mirrors it. Another thing that we've recently been studying and are really happy to see is something called beta endorphin is also released from your pituitary gland. So if you don't know what beta endorphin is, it's one of the body's most powerful opioids. So it's your natural painkiller in your body. And as you're building up lactate, you're gonna see this beta endorphin curve typically will start to go up as well. This is, again, you can kind of think of it from an evolutionary standpoint. If you're a caveman and you're running away from a saber-toothed tiger, one of the last things your body wants you to feel is pain while you're trying to survive. So as you're building up lactate using all those fast twitch fibers, your body starts to put out this endogenous opioid to block the pain to at least get you through that event. Also similar, we're, we're looking at what growth hormone does. Growth hormone, um, it does collagen synthesis. And, and what, we, what we're starting to speculate is as your body is putting out lactate, you're also seeing this purge of growth hormone, which might start to get the reparative process already worked up. So as soon as you get past that bad event, your body moves into repair mode. Then we see just more of this anabolic cascade and the blood flow restriction studies from this happen. And so like growth factor, which comes out of your liver, starts to go up. Vascular endothelial growth factor, which creates cap um, angiogenesis and capillary beds will start to go up. And we'll see this rise in progenitor or the stem cells within the muscle, as well as the mesenchymal stem cells, which, which come out of things like the bone marrow. And then lastly, and one of the most important things that we were really fascinated in seeing was muscle protein synthesis go up because we in rehab have a real muscle protein synthesis problem. And I'll go into a little bit deeper of, of what that problem is and how this might help. When we completely block the venous return, that block in venous return, like I mentioned earlier, will not allow those metabolites to go back. So that whole six to seven minute bout, your body thinks it's really in sheer muscle stress and tear. So it starts to really kind of overreact in the anabolic cascade and things it wants to do um, to, to help supplement that hard intense thing that you just did. We also see that there's a swelling effect. So the limb will start to swell some, and then when you deflate the cuff, that swelling lasts sometimes for minutes, sometimes for hours. It's almost just like a really big pump, like you went to the gym and worked out. That cell, cellular swelling where the muscle cell swells um, might be a mechanism where we can actually stave off or slow down atrophy because as the muscle cell swells, there's little stretch receptors on the muscle cell and that might, looks like it can kick in muscle protein synthesis. So even in the absence of exercise, just getting a limb to start to swell might be something that we can do to slow down the atrophy train during periods of disuse. And then lastly, we see a reduction in stroke volume. So when you're reducing the, the volume of fluid moving back to the heart through the veins, the stroke volume will go down. The cardiac output equation is heart rate times stroke volume. 
when stroke volume goes down, we're going to see heart rate will start to go up to maintain cardiac output. That is something that can be beneficial, especially when we're looking at trying to make gains with aerobic activity. So walking on a treadmill with tourniquets on, riding a bike with at low levels with tourniquets on, we see improvements in VO2. Um, we see improvements in strength and hypertrophy. And this is from, from college athletes all the way up to elderly individuals. And lastly, gene expression is something that we're really getting interested in with this. And so the reduced oxygen can really start to get some gene expression going. And so that's where we start to ask this question, are we in the age of hypoxia right now, or at least brief bouts? And what I mean by that is, don't think of this as just a tourniquet that's squeezing off blood flow, but think about what happens to the limb whenever we have reduced oxygen in it. And so something that's, that's really kind of key to what I'm saying here is, is last year in 2019, in physiology, the Nobel Prize was given to three gentlemen. One was a professor from Harvard, one from Johns Hopkins, and one from Oxford. And it was for their work, decades of work, showing that hypoxia can cause really fundamental changes in gene expression. And so one of their, their key things they looked at is hypoxia induct, inductible factor one, that reduce in oxygen, we'll see this HIF1A come out and, and, it, and it gets basically protected. And we see this downstream things like capillary beds can be built. And so the ability to reduce oxygen into a limb can have drastic changes beyond just what we've been looking at for the muscle fiber itself. And I'm gonna get into a little bit deeper on that here in just a bit. So what does the literature say on comparing blood flow restriction to low level exercise? Well, it's been pretty, pr pretty much across the board um, a, a fact, and it's almost undeniable now that if you compare low level exercise to low level exercise with a tourniquet on, the tourniquet's gonna win every time. We don't know, and, and it probably leans more towards the lifting heavy, that if you can lift heavy, you're gonna do better than lifting light with a tourniquet on. Some of the studies that are kind of even, but the majority of them, we, we really feel lifting heavy is gonna be better than light with a tourniquet on. But if all you can do is lift light, then putting the tourniquet on is probably gonna get you bigger increases in muscle strength and muscle hypertrophy. This is one of the first systematic review or meta-analysis that was done by uh, one of our colleagues, Jeremy Linicky in 2012, that showed the effect size differences. This is if you did the low level exercise with the tourniquet on compared to the studies um, that were work matched that did the same exercises without um, nice effect size difference between the two. Another study was done in 2016 by Dr. Jamie Burr's lab up in Canada um, and basically came to the same conclusion that if you are going to lift light, blood flow restriction is going to beat um, lifting light without it based on what they saw in all the studies. And, and what we really see is the magnitude of these observed changes are noteworthy, particularly considering the relative short duration of the average intervention. So we see changes and actually they can happen rather quickly. Sometimes two to four weeks is all we need to see these kind of rapid um, changes. And then even looking at the systematic reviews and meta-analysis, they haven't just looked at the healthy population. So those are looking at healthies. This is looking at all the clinical papers that have looked at blood flow restriction. So this was um, Dr. Luke Hughes and Stephen Patterson in BJSM a couple years ago that looked at the blood flow restriction studies that compared lifting light to lifting light with a tourniquet on. Clinically, in the clinical studies, the addition of blood flow restriction to these low level exercise will give you about a 69% of the patients experiencing greater strength gain. So the studies look like they all favor blood flow restriction than just lifting light in these clinical populations. A lot of people also say, well, this is, you know, primarily for athletes or young, healthy people. But what we're really interested in and what we think is really the target population that's got the most to gain is the elderly individuals. And so this was a systematic review and meta-analysis done out of Germany that looked at all the studies on strength and hypertrophy in older individuals and really saw that they had some of the best effect sizes. So these pooled effect sizes of two, just really massive and 3.09 when BFR was, was added. So BFR listed significantly greater improvements in muscle strength with those pooled effect sizes. And the application of an external tourniquet seems to facilitate significantly greater responses in muscular strength compared with low level training alone. And so that's in the elderly populations. More and more systematic reviews and meta-analysis just keep coming out and they all kind of keep coming to this same conclusion. If you're gonna lift light, go ahead and put a tourniquet on, you're gonna see bigger effects. 
And this is important because muscle is important. And this is the biggest systematic review and meta-analysis that looked at muscle. So this was 2 million men and women. And what they found is muscle strength is a predictor of all-cause mortality in apparently healthy populations. So your muscle strength is a predictor of your mortality. And if you're coming out of the ICU and you've lost significant amounts of muscle strength, then you've already got the chips stacked up against you when it comes to, to your overall mortality. And we as rehabilitation professionals need to find a way to restore this strength. So why do we lose this amount of muscle? Uh, we know it's from disuse, but if we start to understand what the pathway is, maybe we can start coming up with interventions to address those pathways. And so muscle's pretty straightforward when you look at why we get it and why we lose it. And this is the net protein balance equation. If you eat a bolus of protein, you're gonna see a rise in muscle protein synthesis. Then your body will shut that down after a couple hours, and then you're gonna see muscle protein breakdown. If you're not exercising, lifting weights, you're just eating a sufficient amount of protein, just living life, your body synthesizes enough protein to fix the breakdown. You don't put on muscle just by doing nothing. You don't lose muscle when you're just kind of moving through daily life. So you synthesize, you break down, you synthesize, you stay at net neutral. But if for some reason your synthesis goes down or your breakdown goes up, then this equation all of a sudden becomes negative and then we'll start to lose muscle. So the question is where can we as rehabil rehabilitation professionals help and where is the problem? Do we see less synthesis when people are in the ICU or do we see more breakdown? Or as we probably can imagine, it's a combination of both. We do know from physiological studies that synthesis is a problem. So this is some of the best muscle phys folks in the world um, who have really kind of looked at this in a, in a deep way. And these are called anabolic resistance studies. So you take individuals, these were healthy subjects, and you immobilize one limb. So they're only able to use one limb, they're on crutches, they're typically in a cast with one, the one knee flexed and not able to use it. They do this for two weeks. And what you see after this two weeks is the limb that they were not able to use, muscle protein synthesis drops by about 30%. So that equation, the top line just went down some. Even though they're eating their protein, their, their, their fed state, their muscle protein synthesis starts to go down because they're not using the limb. It's the whole use it or lose it. Your body knows that it takes energy to keep muscle going. If you're not using the muscle, it's waste of energy. It's always, your body's always wanting to protect number one, which is the brain. So it will start doing this muscle dump. That loss of 30% of muscle protein synthesis teases out to about 350 grams of muscle tissue that was lost primarily in the thigh muscle of these individuals. If you don't know what 350 grams is, I don't, I can't, the dang metric system. I never know what anything means when it's in the metric system. Here's a good surrogate. The human heart weighs about 300 grams. So you can see in an individual with one limb who's not using it for a couple of weeks, they're gonna lose more than the size of their heart from a down regulation of muscle protein synthesis. When they retest these individual strength, they lost about 30% of their thigh strength as well. That's the muscle dump, that's called anabolic resistance. That's what we primarily see in orthopedics when our patients come in after a post-op ACL and they've lost a lot of muscle. You can only imagine what this is like whenever you're bedridden. Not only is it from being bedridden or being immobilized, it's also from just having decreased stepping. So this is young men where for a week, they had them just walking less. They had them walk significantly less, about 90% less. Um, but in that study, when they were able to walk some, but significantly less, they still lost almost 30% of their muscle protein synthetic rate. And this thing that I'll talk about in a minute called myostatin went up three times. So even though we might be getting these patients up, moving them around a little bit, their muscle protein synthetic rates are still going down almost the same as if they're in a disuse state. This decreased movement and loss of muscle protein synthesis, which is gonna equal loss of muscle, is kind of what we're seeing as the gateway to what's called sarcopenia, the, the loss of muscle with aging or the loss of muscle with disuse, um, which is a big, big problem in the elderly population that just is losing more and more muscle because they're not able to move enough and their protein synthesis goes down. So we need to do things to try and just increase muscle protein synthesis to offset what's happening during these periods of disuse. 
a study that's over a decade old now looked at this with blood flow restriction. So these individuals did 30%, I mean, sorry, 20% of a one rep max leg extension. So sitting down, just doing leg extensions without a tourniquet. And then the individuals did it with a tourniquet. Without a tourniquet, there was no change in muscle protein synthetic rates. So it stayed right exactly the same here. Whenever they did put the tourniquet on, they saw a rise by 46% at the three hour time point. So just the simple application of blood flow restriction to this exercise, we were able to tackle one of our biggest problems that we see with wasting of muscle is this drop in muscle protein synthetic rate. And it's not only in young, healthy individuals that were able to maybe manipulate this. This is the same um, group who did a second study, but this time in older men. How old? They're 70 year old on average in this study. And when they did low level, 20% one rep max leg extensions, no rise in muscle protein synthetic rates. Whenever they put the blood flow restriction on, they saw a rise at the three hour time point of 56%. That's huge. That means then again, in our PICS patient who's lost muscle, if they're coming in and seeing you and doing just basic sit to stands, walking, low level exercise, you're probably not doing anything to put that muscle back on. If they're in a disuse state in the hospital and they're losing potentially 30% or more of muscle protein synthetic rate, they're dumping muscle while you're not putting muscle on. If you apply the tourniquet to their thigh, upper thigh, upper arm, you can potentially see an increase of protein synthetic rate of 56%, even in elderly individuals who are the ones that are hard to get muscle protein synthesis up. It's very, very important to understand that this will not work without proper nutrition. Exercise like that and to see a rise in muscle protein synthesis requires protein. So we as rehab professionals, if we're dealing with any patient, but especially these post-intensive care syndrome patients, have to have this discussion that we need to do this exercise. You know, we were hoping blood flow restriction is something we're able to look at with this, but you have to couple it with a bolus of protein throughout the day. How much should you do? Well, the biggest systematic review and meta-analysis that was done just a couple of years ago to look at how much protein supplementation is needed for resistance training to gain muscle mass and strength in healthy adults comes out to at least 1.6 grams per kilogram per day. So basically you take, it's this dang metric system again, you gotta take 1.6 grams of, of protein and multiply it by your weight in kilograms, take that number and that's how much your patient would need during the day. That's probably what we think the bare minimum is going to be right now. That's twice the RDA. So that's something to really think about. But that's what we, the kind of numbers we want to supplement with to see if we can increase protein synthesis and give them that bolus of protein to start trying to rebuild muscle. This is, you know, even teased out in some of our orthopedic um, work here as well. If you just give um, uh, total knee patients, 20 grams of essential amino acids twice a day, along with doing the rehab for six weeks after their surgery, that compared with baseline, the group that got protein had significantly less decrease in mean quadriceps muscle volume. So they were able to preserve their muscle volume when they're doing rehab just by giving them essential amino acids twice a day. So we have to have that talk with our people. Not only do we have this muscle protein synthesis problem that starts to go down and we see this muscle dump, but we've got this myostatin problem that I mentioned as well, that whenever individuals walk less, myostatin goes up threefold. We've seen in the ACL literature that after you have ACL up to about 12 weeks, we see this myostatin thing starts to go up. So what the heck is myostatin? So myostatin is an interesting story. Dr. Lee at Johns Hopkins in the 90s tried to knock out the gene responsible for protein synthesis in a mouse. He knocked that gene out. If you stop doing protein synthesis, you should die. The mouse didn't die. Luckily, they didn't sacrifice the mouse. And then weeks later, this one mouse in the cage was huge and it was full of muscle. What they found out was they didn't knock out the gene responsible for protein synthesis. They knocked out the gene that blocks protein synthesis. So as myostatin goes up, it actually starts to take protein synthesis down. So not only do we need to see something that increases protein synthetic rate, but realistically, we want to see that the myostatin gene goes down as well to allow that protein synthesis to rise. There's some things in, in nature that are born myostatin deficient. Belgian blue steers um, do not have the myostatin gene. They just put on tons of muscle because nothing's regulating their protein synthesis. So our people that are laying down, doing nothing or not moving as much, 
We're seeing their protein synthetic rates go down and their myostatin levels go up, which means it's blocking um, the ability to put on muscle. When you lift heavy, myostatin expression goes down. So this is looking at it over weeks in a Brazilian study here. Low intensity exercise, myostatin gene expression was not significantly reduced. So it's still saying don't put on any muscle from doing this. Doing blood flow restriction, this one was done at 80% limb occlusion pressure um, in the lower extremities. We saw that the myostatin gene expression was down almost exactly the same as the lifting heavy group. So these two are your options. You can lift heavy to take down this myostatin gene. You can lift light at 80% limb occlusion pressure with a tourniquet on and you can take it down. Lifting light again, it's not gonna increase your protein synthesis. It's not gonna knock down your myostatin gene expression. We're probably failing in getting that muscle back on that they lost and that's why maybe we're seeing this, the, the systematic review meta analysis say what we're doing isn't enough. So when and where should we begin this? Maybe we should not even do it with PICS. We should start to do it in the ICU. You might say, whoa, that's crazy. You're gonna start doing blood flow restriction, putting tourniquets on people in the ICU. Well, there, there might be potential um, and a reason why we should do this. One of the reasons is the muscle dump happens really, really fast. So this is a really good lab out of Europe, Europe Luke Van Loon's lab, that looked at one week of bed rest and found that it leads to substantial muscle atrophy. So one week of bed rest, you lose 3.1 pounds of muscle in this study. From some of their same work, the authors concluded that we lose as much muscle in one week of bed rest as we gain by 12 weeks of intense resistance type of exercise training. So that one week is going to take you at least three months of high intensity, 70% 1RM ACSM guideline type lifting to be able to restore it. That's a problem then, because many of these patients with PICS have been in the ICU. Remember we said the longer they're in, the worse their loss of muscle is. And so it happens quick. So can we maybe get in there quickly to help them? One motive or one way that we might be able to do this is what's called cellular swelling with blood flow restriction or passive BFR. What we're gonna um, also talk about remote ischemic preconditioning. And so this is the application of a tourniquet without exercise. And what we've seen in healthy studies, as well as with some clinical studies, which I'll go over, is just the application of the tourniquet, cycling it on and off and on and off. We see that we can maybe slow down the atrophy train. So this is one of them that looked at it. Um, individuals were, were put into the same kind of protocol I talked about earlier, where they were immobilized on one leg and couldn't use it for two weeks. Um, one group got a tourniquet put on their leg and they inflated it five times for five minutes and five minutes off and they did that in the morning and in the afternoon the other group just was immobilized whenever they looked at their loss of knee strength the group that had the tourniquet on um, only lost about 10 percent of their knee strength the control group that didn't have the tourniquet on lost almost 30 percent of their knee strength same numbers that we saw from anabolic resistance their hamstrings they lost about 3.5 percent strength after two weeks if they just inflated the tourniquets morning and afternoon the control group lost about 19 percent of their knee strength the plantar flexors, almost no loss. If they put the tourniquets on and inflated them in the morning and in the afternoon, the control group lost about 16%. So just getting this cellular swelling to happen, making the muscle cells swell from the push of fluid and pushing those stretch receptors might have stimulated protein synthesis enough to slow down that loss of atrophy. We're not seeing hypertrophy from this, but we're seeing less muscle loss happen. This has also been shown in some clinical models. And so this is an ACL study where they started that same protocol three days after ACL and they did it to 14 days post. One group just did their range of motion exercises, patellar mobs, and, and didn't apply a tourniquet. The other group did the same thing, but they put a tourniquet on for five rounds of five minutes on with five minutes off in the morning and the afternoon. If you put that on and created this passive BFR effect, you mitigated the loss of atrophy by over half. So their quads only lost 9.4% in this group compared to about 21% in the control group. And the total loss of size of muscle in the thigh was only 6% in the, in the blood flow restriction group compared to 14.5% in the control group. Very easy application just passively here. But it might not be that it's affecting protein synthesis with this. It might be that when we're applying this into uh, individuals who are not able to do exercise, that we're slowing the breakdown. So this 
isn't breaking down more. And the reason why we might think this is a theory that we would go after is what's called remote ischemic preconditioning. So this comes from the cardiac world and it's one of the, probably the most popular things that, that we really see on our Google Scholar alerts right now in our organization. And that's the application of a tourniquet passively. So just putting it on and off, on and off, no exercise to the upper arm or the lower leg. And in studies that's been shown to protect the heart from, from um, having damage to protect the brain. There's two huge trials going on, um, one, in, one in Europe and, and one in Japan um, with, with over 1,500 subjects in each study, seeing if they put these tourniquets on after strokes, can it protect the brain from damage, protects the liver, the lungs, the stomach, um, as well as skeletal muscle tissue. We don't know the exact mechanism. It could be it's a neural pathway. It could be probably the pathway we think the most in our organization. It's, a, it's, it's in the blood um, whenever you do this, or it could be a systemic response. Um, but we do have a study from one of our colleagues that showed that we can maybe block muscle breakdown if we just put these tourniquets on after something bad happens to muscle. So in this study, he had healthy subjects do box jumps. So off a two foot box, they did a hundred box jumps. So just a, it was a mean protocol just to destroy the quads of these individuals. Once they got done with those box jumps, they laid down in one group got 220 millimeters of mercury, so pretty much close to full occlusion. In the lower extremities, they just laid there. They had that come on three rounds for five minutes with five minutes off. So they went to full occlusion for three rounds for five minutes. The sham group did the same protocol, but they only did 20 millimeters of, of uh, occlusion. When they measured a direct marker of muscle damage, creatine kinase, the group that had the occlusion on two days out had significantly less muscle damage and three days out, had significantly less muscle damage. So they blocked that muscle damage from happening by the application of the tourniquet after that bad event happened to muscle. Also, whenever they looked at strength returning, 24 hours, 48 hours, and by 72 hours, they were back to baseline if they put that tourniquet on because they had less muscle damage. The control group at 24, 48, and 72 hours still had muscle weakness due to their muscle damage. So putting this on in the ICU, might be a way to slow down the muscle breakdown that's happening so that equation doesn't get negative. We're still trying to keep it, you know, it's still negative, but not as negative because maybe the muscle damage is being pushed up a little bit. And to also show that, you know, this isn't 100% out there, there is an ICU study that's been done that has looked at this. So this was done in Brazil and they did the addition of blood flow restriction to passive mobilization. So same protocol basically, put the tourniquets on in the morning and the afternoon and did passive range of motion and inflated, I, I, I believe it was for three rounds with five minutes on, five minutes off. And the blood flow restriction group consistently had less loss of muscle compared to the control group. So there's a linear relationship between time and loss. As we know, the longer you're in, the more you're losing. But if you put the tourniquets on, you significantly mitigated that loss of muscle tissue. So this is something I think that we should really look at more. There's already a trial that's, that's wrapped up in Europe. They didn't have big numbers, but they showed that it was safe um, in ICU patients. And this might be something that we can look at starting it early in the ICU to slow down the muscle loss and then as soon as they're able to start exercising, combining it with exercise so we can start driving that muscle back with muscle protein synthesis as well as adequate um, protein intake. What I'd like to talk about now then is switch from what I think is kind of the low hanging fruit was that if you're weak from muscle loss, blood flow restriction, it just seems like a no brainer. That's why it's taken off so much in the military world where, where I started it with, as well as the sports world where, where we've really gone to and we have all these orthopedic trials because it just returns muscle so, so easy it seems like after, after disuse. But what about this whole thing that's going on with COVID? Is blood flow restriction okay to do with a patient with COVID? Is it dangerous to do with a patient with COVID? And I think we have to go a little bit into what's going on with COVID-19 to understand some of these pathways. So COVID-19 starts out as a disease of the lungs. So the virus comes in and it moves down to our lower portions of our lungs and it will move down to our cells which have what's called the ACE2 receptor. So the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. So remember that. So the endothelial lining is all aligned with these ACE2 receptors. These ACE2 receptors are what the virus targets. It fits perfectly like a keyhole in there. So the ACE2 receptor will unfortunately be 
what is consumed by the virus, it takes it over. And when the virus hijacks the ACE2 receptor, it will move its um, RNA material into the cell. And that is where it replicates virus material so that it can keep the virus moving throughout your body and move to other areas. So initially it comes into the lungs. The problem though, is everyone was thinking that this was a pulmonary problem, that we're gonna see our COPD patients and our ARDS patients, um, all these people who have pulmonary issues, we're gonna be the ones that suffer because we know the virus was attaching, attacking the ACE2 receptor in the lower lung fields. What we're really seeing though, is this is more of an oxidative stress problem because these individuals, the obese, the diabetics, the cardiovascular disease, the cancers, the ones who we say are the oxidative stress diseases, which I'll go into deeper, are the ones that are having the highest hospitalizations and the highest mortality rates. Not the pulmonary problems like we thought, but more of these oxidative stress problems. <clears throat> And so here's some data that we're already starting to see. And this is from New York. If you look at the oxidative stress folks, so the hypertensives, 57% of the New York um, coronavirus cases were hypertensives, but only 29% of the population in New York is, is hypertensive. Cardio, um, 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 sorry, obesity, 42% of the patients with COVID-19 in New York were um, hospitalized, were hospitalized um, who were obese, but only 28% of these individuals are in the New York population. So these are kind of taking a bigger hit than what we see over here on this side. COPD, only 5% of the patients hospitalized with coronavirus had COPD, and that's compared to 5% within the population in New York. So much smaller numbers here than what we were seeing on this other side. And to kind of show it into to maybe a, a better graph here, Deaths from chronic lower respiratory disease up in the Northeast um, were only about 400 above normal between March and May. Deaths from all the other respiratory diseases were only about 400 more than what would be normally seen in March and May. Deaths from heart disease due to COVID-19 were three times higher during that same period. So that group, the oxidative stress individuals had a much higher mortality rate than these respiratory individuals. So it's really attacking those folks much, much more. And we're starting to see all these headlines with um, from headaches to COVID toes, coronavirus symptoms have been a bizarre mix. And so from this, from this article, um, this doctor out of the uh, cardiologist out of University of Zurich says the lung is the main battlefield, but this is a disease of the blood vessels. Um, another doctor in the same article says the common mechanism appears to be the inflammation of the endothelium, the lining of the arteries, the layer cells that make up the inner lining of the blood vessels. As the endothelium is present everywhere, you can explain why the symptoms have been so different. So it's a disease that starts in the lung fields and then it moves out to the endothelium of the vessels. And so coronavirus may be a blood vessel disease, according to scientists. And so now not only is it not what you know, we're seeing everyone's reporting, now we're starting to see studies that are confirming this. So this recent study in the, in the journal Lancet um, basically said coronavirus infects the cells that line the inside of blood vessels. So what exactly is going on here? So, so to explain it, again, it starts in the lungs, proliferates, and then it moves to the endothelium. And as it travels in the blood, the endothelium of our arteries are all lined with these ACE2 receptors. So the COVID-19 virus is moving through our arteries looking for those ACE2 receptors. Once it binds on our endothelium to these ACE2 receptors, then it basically will hijack this ACE2 and that's where we start to see inflammation develop and we start to see damage to the, to the vessel and then we'll start to see things like blood clots, which we'll go into in just a minute. So what we thought was just gonna be a, an, an ARDS problem is actually probably more of an oxidative stress problem. And so why is this a problem and, and what's going on and why are we seeing um, oxidative stress? So we have to understand the pathway and what ACE2 does. So angiotensin is converted to angiotensin converting enzyme. So this is an ACE2, this is just ACE. ACE is converted into angiotensin two. And then from there, 
we see that it increases free radical production, oxidative stress, the superoxides. So this pathway is directly involved with increasing oxidative stress. That's why people take ACE inhibitors to block this pathway. ACE2 will come in and it actually can break down angiotensin 2, turn it to angiotensin 1,7, and then we see it will reduce oxidative stress. So if your ACE2 receptors are all on board, you have plenty of them, they're healthy, then there's not a problem. Once the virus hijacks them and basically destroys the ACE2, this pathway is wiped out. And now all you have is a massive increase in free radical production. To make things worse, the immune response, so when neutrophils start to proliferate to fight the virus, their direct job is to create more free radicals. They create free radicals, hydrogen peroxides, the superoxides, because they just directly go out and just kill things. So our immune systems making free radicals to kill things, this pathway is just going crazy because the ACE2 receptor can't do anything because it's full of virus right now. And now you have these folks who are already in oxidative stress because of their diseases. They have way too much free radical production now this tips the scale and why we're seeing such mortality. So we want to choose interventions that work, but that have a low reactive oxygen species, low oxidative stress. So to be tip of the spear, to be kind of ninjas in our profession right now, not only do we want to say we want to do things to increase strength and hypertrophy, but with these individuals, not just the COVID patients, the cardiovascular disease patients, the diabetes patients, I don't want to do something that increases all their free radical production because they're already too full of that um, and, it's, and it's not good for them. Here's the rub. Lifting heavy increases free radical production. That's part of, uh, part of its whole mechanism. So high intensity exercise induce oxidative stress. Oxidative stress biomarkers responses to acute sessions of hypertrophy training. Plasma carbonyls, which is the reactive oxygen species, increase the exercise duration. So when you do intense exercise, long endurance activities, you're gonna see that your body puts out more free radicals. If you have a lot of ACE2 receptors, you have young, healthy, good endothelium, that's not a problem because it can fight it off. That balance is there. If you don't have those, you're already oxidative stress, your ACE2 receptors are inhibited, increase in this free radical production, is what is, seems to be tipping people over, not the exercise, but from COVID. And just to kind of put it into to, to kind of the final thing here, this is an American Journal of Hypertension uh, study that when after they, they finished, we concluded that a high intensity resistance training program increases arterial stiffness and wave reflection in young, healthy women. Our present interventional results are consistent with previous cross-sectional studies in men, which high intensity strength training is associated with arterial stiffening. So, Again, these are the exercises that would restore strength and hypertrophy, but with these COVID patients or these oxidative stress people might not be the best exercises for them. So does blood flow restriction exercise with low level um, loads increase oxidative stress or does it attenuate it or decrease it? So this is the first study um, to really look at it that I'm aware of. It was done in conjunction with the VA. And what they found was that if from baseline resting levels, if you just put a tourniquet on and inflated it without exercise, free radical production went up significantly. So oxidative stress went up significantly. If you lifted heavy, 70% of a one rep max, free radical production went up significantly as we know it does. If you put the tourniquet on and lifted heavy, we really took it up. So that's really takes it up here. So lifting heavy and lifting heavy, the tourniquet on both took it up. If you did blood flow restriction exercise at light loads, we saw that it significantly brought down free radical production. So this was their baseline free radical production after doing blood flow restriction exercise. Um, we saw that it was significantly attenuated. So this is kind of the first study that did plasma markers to show that actually applying blood flow restriction and doing low level exercise, we saw an attenuation or bump down of free radical production. Another recent study that looked at this um, also has kind of given some new light. And so this is one of our colleagues, Jamie Burr's lab, who we do research with. He's up at the University of Guelph. What he did was a biopsy study. So they did biopsies in the thigh prior to doing blood flow restriction exercise. So they did single leg squats on this kind of fancy contraption they've set up here. 
at 30% of a one rep max. They use a limb occlusion pressure between 70 to 80% um, uh, in, in their individuals. And then once they were done with that blood flow restriction session, they did another biopsy to see was there more free radical production in the muscle after doing this. And what they found, their key points was, Blood flow restriction exercise is capable of inducing comparable adaptations to traditional res resistance exercise despite a lower total exercise volume, which we know already. In the human skeletal muscle tissue from the biopsies though, they demonstrated that both maximal and submaximal mitochondrial free radical production reactive oxygen species emission rates were acutely decreased two hours following BFR resistance exercise, but not resistance exercise occurring along with a reduction in tissue oxygenation. So basically the resistance exercise group, their biopsies, there was increased free radicals. The blood flow, re or, or there wasn't a, a, a buffering of it. The blood flow restriction group, after they took biopsies of, after the exercise, it actually had pushed the free radical production down. Altogether, these data indicate that mitochondrial free radical emission rates are attenuated following BFR resistance exercise, and such a response is likely influenced by reductions in oxygen. So the blood flow restriction group again here had a buffering or a blocking of free radical production. Oxygen is the species that wants to take up these free radicals. The electron transport chain, if there are electro, extra electrons, Oxygen is what will take up those elect extra electrons and become a superoxide, become a free radical, which is part of all these cardiovascular diseases and things like that. It, it's good things in low numbers. That's how the immune system works. In high numbers, it's not good things. Jamie's lab um, theorized that because the blood flow restriction group had less oxygen in the limb available, that there was less oxygen to be oxidized into a free radical. And that's why we had this buffering or, or less free radical production there. I'd also like to put out an alternative hypothesis there. Let's go back to the ACE2 receptor. So in this study, individuals, um, this is from Kyle Hackney's lab at, at, and, um, and, and his colleagues up at um, North Dakota State. What they showed is that after doing blood flow restriction at 80% limb occlusion pressure in the lower extremity, ACE2 activity went up significantly. So the ACE2, the good thing, the thing that's blocked right now by COVID, the thing that blocks free radical production after doing blood flow restriction exercise was significantly elevated, okay? Also, the stem cell within the vessel, the progenitor cell, what they call CD34 cells in the study was significantly higher in the blood flow restriction group compared to the control group. This is what repairs the endothelium. This is what repairs the vasculature after damage. So more ACE2, so less free radical production and more stem cell production if they did the exercises at pretty high occlusion, our recommendations, 80% limb occlusion pressure in the lower extremity. So this begs the question, okay, ACE2, it could be, or it is beneficial. If I have more ACE2, I have less free radical production. But if I have more ACE2, does that mean I have more receptors for all the virus to go to? So if I do BFR and I increase a bunch of ACE2, maybe I'm reducing free radical production and less oxidative stress, but am I just opening up a whole bunch of receptors for COVID-19 to go to? And so luckily this has been looked at recently. And so let's go back to this pathway. Angiotensin is converted to angiotensin converting enzyme to angiotensin 2, and then you get free radical production. ACE2 blocks it through angiotensin 1.7, and you have less free radical production. People take ACE inhibitors and people take angiotensin receptor blockers to block this pathway. But what happens is when you take those, you actually will increase ACE2 production. So people who are taking ACE inhibitors, people who are taking angiotensin receptor blockers right now, who are the majority, a lot of these patients are the ones getting COVID, they're also creating more ACE2. So is that a problem that we've seen in the literature? Luckily, the New England Journal of Medicine just put out a really large study to look at this. And so basically what they wanted to look at is ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, ARBs, may upregulate ACE2 expression, thus increasing the availability of target molecules for SARS-CoV-2. So they wanted to see, is this a problem? 
they, they looked at all the studies that are out there right now that have looked at it. The first one was 11 countries of almost 9,000 subjects. Neither ACE inhibitors nor ARBs were associated with an increased risk of in-hospital death. A secondary analysis that was restricted to patients with hypertension, those for whom an ACE inhibitor or ARB would be indicated, also did not show harm. The second study was done in Italy with 6,272 subjects. In a conditional logistic regression multivariate analysis, neither ACE inhibitors nor ARBs were associated with the likelihood of a SARS-CoV-2 infection. So having more of these receptors did not make your outcomes worse or increase your infection risk. In New York City, almost 13,000 subjects, the investigators showed no positive association for any of the analyzed drug classes, including ACE inhibitors and ARBs, for either a positive test or a severe illness. So what their conclusion was in, Jan in New England Journal, was professional scientific societies and experts have spoken with one voice in advising that patients should not discontinue their ACE inhibitors, ARBs, out of concern they are at increased risk of infection, severe illness, or death during COVID-19 pandemic. That's good. That means, yes, we can send in maybe more ACE2 through doing blood flow restriction and low-level exercise, which decreases oxidative stress. You got to think about this more than just the COVID-19 patients. All these patients you see with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, they have oxidative stress. If we're doing the blood flow restriction, not only are we giving them potentially more muscle and strength, but we're giving them more ACE2 receptors and more progenitor cells to heal their endothelium and decrease that oxidative stress. So let's go back again to this. If we're seeing all this oxidative stress in the arteries, what's the byproduct of the ACE2 receptor being inhibited? Well, the byproduct is this. Whenever the virus attacks ACE2, that causes inflammation. That inflammation that is caused from the um, ACE2 receptor being hijacked increases von Willebrand factor, VWF. When von Willebrand factor is increased, then factor eight is released into the lumen of the artery. And what we're gonna start to see from that is blood clots. So that hijacking of the ACE receptor, that associated inflammation, the endothelium being injured makes the, the artery want to heal itself. Von Willenbrand factor goes up. We're going to see factor A go up, and then we're going to start to see these thrombosis increase. And, and we see this in, in the studies. And so this study that, that measured it on day 21, they observed a concurrent massive elevation of VWF on Willenbrand factor. It was up 555%. So let's go back through this. The virus goes to ACE2. That ACE2 receptor is going to increase free radical production, which is going to cause inflammation and stress and damage. You're going to get endothelial cell dysfunction, which is going to increase von Willenbrand factor, and you're going to get blood clots. And these are the headlines we're seeing everywhere. Coronavirus, a third of hospital patients develop dangerous blood clots. Coronavirus patients are coming in with strokes because they, had, they threw a clot. They're opening up the lung fields in their autopsies and seeing blood clots everywhere instead of just pulmonary edema. It's from the endothelial damage and the increase in von Willenbrand factor in this factor eight. Okay, then you're gonna say, well, tourniquets scare me then because tourniquets produce clots. That's not true. And that's not what we've seen from the tourniquet literature, not what we've seen from the blood flow restriction literature, and not what we've seen from our millions of clinical visits that we've done with blood flow restriction. So this is an early you know, study. Do thigh tourniquets contribute to the formation of intraoperative venous emboli? Um, the conclusion, despite the substantial risk of postoperative deep vein throm venous thrombosis and orthopedic extremity surgery, a use of a pneumatic tourniquet does not appear to be an independent risk factor. So if you have subjects who have surgery, one group uses a tourniquet, one group doesn't, and you measure, is there increased thrombus in the tourniquet groups? There's multiple studies out there that show there isn't an increase, it's not an independent risk factor. Stasis is a risk factor for thrombosis. Vascular injury is an increased um, factor for, for thrombosis. The tourniquet in itself is just creating that occlusive effect. And paradoxically, and this is from Colonel, um, Colonel John Craig, who was the lead, um, one of our lead, uh, tourniquet experts at my base here when we were working on um, developing our blood flow restriction protocols. Um, what they showed us was paradoxically, when you deflate the tourniquet, you increase the anti-thrombosis -throm um, activity. We see a reduction in the, throtting, um, the, the clotting cascade when you release or deflate the tourniquet. So let's kind of see the proof here. What about von Willebrand factor? Well, this is a study that was done um, uh, over four weeks using blood flow restriction. And after four weeks, they saw that von Willenbrand factor was significantly decreased in the blood flow restriction group compared to the control group. 
So the clotting mechanism here was significantly reduced after a four week window if you did the low level exercise with the tourniquet on. Maybe because when you're doing blood flow restriction, you're increasing ACE2 receptors and that is not causing endothelial damage and a release of the, of the, um, of the clotting cascade. Another paper that looked at von Willenbrand factor after doing blood flow restriction four weeks, von Willenbrand factor decreased significantly in the blood flow restriction group. So what about other markers for um, coagulation or thrombus? Well, typically what you're going to see is things like D-dimer measured or fibrinogen measured. And so there, those have been looked at in the blood flow restriction um, studies. So the acute studies, which means I measure blood, I do one round of blood flow restriction, I measure blood again to see if it activated the clotting cascade. Um, there's been quite a few that have looked at that. In young healthy, blood flow restriction did not increase any of those blood markers for thrombus. In 24 hours of bed rest and 8,000 foot simulated altitude, blood flow restriction did not increase those markers um, for thrombus. Elderly subject, no increase in markers for thrombus. Ischemic heart disease patients, no increase in markers for blood damage. What about the chronic studies? So studies done over weeks, you know, you do blood flow restriction multiple times a week for several weeks. Do we see there's an increase in blood markers whenever you do that? And we don't see that. So four weeks of training, no increase in markers for, um, for thrombus. 12 weeks of training in the lower extremity of the elderly, no signs of markers for thrombus. 12 weeks of training in the upper extremity of the elderly, no signs of markers for thrombus. Four, this was a study we did in the DOD, four weeks of doing um, blood flow restriction after knee surgery, duplex ultrasound scan measurements for, for thrombus, no signs in either the control or the blood flow restriction group for thrombus markers. So the acute studies, the chronic studies, the tourniquet literature all tell us that this is not the clot producer. This should probably not be your concern. Um, they, they all really back us up here. But what about the stimulation of the fibrinolytic system? Do we see that doing blood flow restriction will increase the anti-clotting cascade? So to look at that, you look at what's called TPA antigen. So this is basically liquid plumber for the vessels. This is what they give folks now after they've had a stroke or they're concerned with blood clotting that it really will break down any thrombus activity. After four weeks of doing blood flow restriction, TPA, the good stuff that breaks down clots, was significantly elevated. Um, almost to the same levels as lift and heavy. We know lift and heavy also increases the anti-clotting um, uh, TPA antigen as well. So both of them, 0.01, were significantly elevated after four weeks. The authors concluded regarding the theoretical, theoretical risk associated with blood clotting, these exercises enhance fibrolytic potential without elevating the thrombolytic potential because they also measured fibrinogen and D-dimer, the inflammatory marker CRP, were not increased acutely after one bout or after four weeks. This has also been shown that TPA goes up in several other blood flow restriction studies. This is also maybe a positive because now there's, um, it's been fast-tracked in the FDA that TPA, the stroke drug, might be something that we need to give to help COVID-19 patients avoid ventilators because they're dying again of clots more than they are of these pulmonary issues. So again, if something we can do with these patients increases TPA, it might be following what um, is already being looked at in the, in the medical side um, pharmacologically. So angiotensin converting enzyme two helps the endothelium. It protects it and attenuates atherosclerosis. So you want to have more ACE2 to help protect the endothelium. COVID-19 is hijacking it. ACE2 protects endothelial cell function and prevents early atherosclerosis by, inhib by inhibiting in the inflammatory response. ACE2 and angiotensin 17 significantly inhibit atherosclerotic lesions formation via protection of endothelial function and inhibition of inflammatory response. It looks like blood flow restriction increases ACE2. So much so that, or not so much so, but what is, is always kind of fascinating is when we can do something in physical therapy that the drug companies are already going after. You know, they're trying to go after myostatin blockers. They haven't been able to do it. Maybe if we lift heavy or if we do blood flow restriction light level, we can decrease myostatin and, and do something the drug companies are going after. They're also looking at ACE2 based treatment approaches, maybe a novel approach to limit aberrant vascular responses and their atherothrombosis. So what they're looking at is, yeah, we, if we can do things to increase ACE2, 
we might be able to help with these vascular responses and atherothrombosis. Well, we showed you earlier, we can maybe increase ACE2, it looks like, from a good study out of a, a good lab. What I want to talk about now, then, is a surrogate model, because we haven't done blood flow restriction for the COVID-19 patients yet. But there's another oxidative stress group who we just had a study wrap up on, and that is on Parkinson's patients. So oxidative stress resulting from the imbalance between reactive oxygen species formation and antioxidant defenses plays a major role in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease. And so this is basically a, 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 a journal article discussing that this is an oxidative stress group, this Parkinson's patients. So we, um, um, supported Dr. Annie Bain at Baylor University with her dissertation in this study, which is a, a really well done study, looking at can blood flow restriction help the vasculature of Parkinson's patients? So help their endothelium get better, reduce this oxidative load, as well as increasing strength and motor function. And so the excessive reactive oxygen species results in destruction of the beta cells in Parkinson's patients and increased oxidation of low density lipoprotein and dysfunction of endothelial cells. Basically, the main treatment they take right now is levodopa, but levodopa has been shown to cause endothelial cell dysfunction. So their treatment actually makes their vascularity even worse, and these patients unfortunately often die of cardiovascular disease. Their signs are really in your face. Their vasculature is so bad that lots of Parkinson's patients suffer with what's called the purple hand syndrome because they're just not getting good blood flow because of this endothelial stress and stiffness that's going on. So Dr. Bain's study was blood flow restriction three days a week for just one month. Um, they did three sets of 20 reps at 20% of a one rep max, and we used a lower level of oxygen, of, of limb occlusion pressure. Um, we used enough to get an effect, which 60% we think is our cutoff. Then they had the control group do high intensity resistance training, three sets of eight reps at 80% of a one rep max, because there has been literature to show that high intensity resistance training helps Parkinson's patients. But high intensity resistance training, as I mentioned earlier, if you're already in oxidative stress, can make your endothelium stiffer and can make it worse, which is not what these patients want. So we want to see if we could help their endothelium. And so what we found was some really fascinating, or what Dr. Bain found was some really fascinating results. Homocysteine levels, which is a, a direct marker of, of, of cardiac issues going, going south, you want to see these levels go down. In the high intensity resistance training group, it went down modestly. The blood flow restriction group, homocysteine levels went down significantly and went down significantly more than the lift and heavy group. The control group, um, which didn't do any exercise, obviously no, no change at all in those groups, but homocysteine went down significantly with a low intensity BFR group. Um, and went down more than lifting heavy. Increase in peripheral blood flow. So in an angiogenic effect that we see overall increased blood flow did not increase with the lifting heavy group in either right or left leg, but the blood flow restriction group, we saw an increase in, in the total peripheral blood flow in both limbs. And most importantly, the primary outcome here was did we see an improvement in endothelial function? And we did. So you want to see this level go up. The high intensity resistance training group, the level we saw went down, which is consistent with the literature. The blood flow restriction group, we saw that the endothelial function improved significantly. This was the target and the mechanisms all make sense of why we think this would work. So the conclusions were the vascular health of, of her samples um, displayed alarming levels of homocysteine and decreased endothelial function and peripheral circulation. So these folks had the purple hand syndrome. They had really, um, really bad um, endothelium and oxidative stress. Strength improvements were similar to lifting heavy in the blood flow restriction group, which is consistent. So their strength was, was pretty much equal to lifting heavy, but the blood flow restriction group had overall motor evaluations that were greater. And most importantly, the endothelial improvements were much greater with low intensity resistance training with blood flow restriction. So oxidative stressed out group, the same as the COVID-19 patients, the same as a lot of these ICU PICS patients, um, we were able to see that we could improve their endothelial function, maybe by increasing more ACE2, by decreasing the free radical production when they do these exercise, by improving angiogenesis, um, we see these good changes. Our majority of our studies so far 
um, and our organization have looked at orthopedic problems, ACLs, bone fractures, um, total joints, things like that. Just to point out though, we are really moving into this population, as you can tell from the Baylor study that just wrapped up. Um, we're starting um, neurologic trials and, and things like diabetes. And this is also important for the COVID talk. Diabetes status increased the mortality risk of patients with COVID-19. Again, it's another oxidative stress group with their endothelium, their vasculature bad. The only thing that we can really maybe do is try and get well-controlled blood glucose because that correlates with improved outcomes in these infected patients. And when currently we have a trial going on with the German Diabetes Center, which is the largest diabetes um, national um, organization over in Germany, looking at doing blood flow restriction in these individuals. And our main outcome is change in insulin sensitivity by blood flow restriction um, compared to classic resistance training. We're also looking at change in skeletal, skeletal muscle uh, mass, but seeing if we can get these kind of individuals and decrease their blood glucose um, through some interventions that we can do as therapists. Also in this population, there's things like a COPD trial going on at the University of Zurich, um, seeing if these uh, individuals with COPD can do exercises with blood flow restriction to improve their COPD symptoms. So how would you apply this? Let's get a little bit practical now. First off, if you have a patient that is in the ICU, we would basically look at following that Brazilian ICU study. We would look at doing remote ischemic preconditioning, uh, which is just putting the, the tourniquet on and inflating it, deflating it. It's also known as cell swelling in the BFR literature. Um, the term now that's being used quite a bit is we're calling it passive BFR. So that's the application of the tourniquet without exercise. This is a patient that's intubated, in a coma, can't do anything really at all. Um, this would just be to slow down this atrophy train. You typically, uh, we do the lower extremities, it's just a bigger muscle um, group to target. Um, we would do it unilaterally. We don't wanna put too much stress by, by including bilateral in these individuals. Um, so we do you know, maybe the left leg and then switch to the right leg. It's anywhere from three to five sets. Uh, we, we typically on our, on our protocols and the machines we use, it's set automatically at three sets. Um, you do for five minutes on for five minutes off. In this, because there's no exercise, the RIPC literature shows that we need to be really at 100% limb occlusion pressure. So when we're doing this kind of model, we're typically doing it at 100% limb occlusion and it needs to be done often. So we would be doing this in the morning, in the afternoon, in the ICU. Taking it up a notch though, would be combining it with electrical stimulation. So just applying the tourniquets, below the cuff and getting some muscle contraction. Now we're gonna get a little bit more of a bump up in all those factors we're, we're really wanting to look at. And there's several papers that have looked at this, that can you combine blood flow restriction with electrical stimulation? And, and in this study, uh, they did 23 minutes of blood flow restriction with E-STEM or E-STEM alone twice a day. And the low intensity um, E-STEM with blood flow restriction increased muscle strength and hypertrophy in these young male um, individuals more than just NMES alone. And like I said, other studies have also um, come to this conclusion. Um, we've worked with the University of Delaware to come up with best parameters. The frequency would be 50 to 75 Hertz. Pulse duration of 400 microseconds. Intensity um, would be five to 10% of a MVC or at least as much as the person can tolerate. So as the person's maybe coming to more, um, or maybe even when they're, when, they're, when they're still in a comatose state, combining blood flow restriction in that same kind of RIPC model, but with electrical stimulation, we're probably gonna get more of an effect. Once you start getting muscle contractions and doing things, we can take the LOP down. So this is where you would start to move down more into the, the clinical parameters that we use of 60 to 80% limb occlusion pressure. Then once they're able to start to really move around, maybe go to the uh, acute care rehab gym, the skilled nursing facility or an outpatient facility, then we can really start to see the biggest bang for our buck. That's doing blood flow restriction exercise with these lower loads, doing active exercises. And that's where we start to see muscle protein synthesis goes up, myostatin goes down, and we start to see an increase in strength and hypertrophy. Or another model that, that I love and I think would be perfect for this population would be just doing things like walking on a treadmill or spinning on a bike. Um, with the tourniquets on, either unilateral or bilateral. 
Um, because what we've seen, and there's, there's quite a few studies, it seems like every one of these studies comes out positive, that if you do aerobic exercise with the tourniquets, um, we see increases in things like muscle strength in these elderly individuals. Um, we see increases in thigh and leg hypertrophy in these elderly individuals. Their sit to stand significantly improved and their timed up and go improved. And then, like I said, there's, there's quite a few geriatric um, endurance walking studies that have shown really positive uh, muscle changes in this population. And that's an easy exercise. I think that we could give most of these folks um, in the acute um, rehab settings, skilled nursing facilities to start seeing some real changes. For the resistance exercise, this is where we really start to shoot for where we, we can get in this 20 to 30% of a one rep max. Limb occlusion pressures, again, like I mentioned, 60 to 80% in the lower extremity, 50% um, limb occlusion pressure for the upper extremity. We follow this 30, 15, 15, 15 protocol with a 30 second rest period. Um, for the endurance protocols, you typically just go at a walking speed or if you're on a bike, you do low level cycling. The LLPs are the same um, and the durations are typically 15 to 25 minutes, although you might need to build individuals up by doing just a few minutes um, a day to start off until they start to get that capacity back. We put out a position stand paper um, last year in Frontiers in Physiology. It was a bunch of, of us blood flow restriction researchers from around the world, and we have all these guidelines laid out in that Frontiers in Physiology position stand paper. It's open access for people to see. If you like this information and you would like to take a deeper dive, you can go to our website, owensrecoveryscience.com. We have all sorts of blogs um, touching on everything from, from what I've talked about um, today to, to on down the line. We have podcasts which really take a deep dive into everything. This is one just talking about that passive BFR and cell swelling. And if you really would like to, to learn a lot more, we have courses throughout the US as well as Europe and um, Asia um, if you would like to, to take a full on course in this topic. Our references are, will be available. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to email us at info at myself and Dr. Kahalan, thank you for your time.